Welcome everyone to another episode of the Revenue Throughput Podcast. And our guest today is Greg Knowles, CEO and founder of ATI Electrical Supply Company. And Greg is a business builder, entrepreneur. He has a great story to share with us on how he's built his business in three highly competitive markets and how he's used core values, I mean, real principles to help create an environment, a culture of achievement, accountability, and uh, a place that people really want to be part of. So without further ado, let's welcome Greg to our podcast. Hey, welcome, Greg, to the Revenue Throughput Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah. it. No, absolutely. Our, our pleasure. So, uh, Greg, you know, you're uh, one reason I was interested in talking to you because you're, you're running a, uh, a, you run a business, right? And it's, a, a, is it ATI Electric Supply? ATI Electrical Supply. Yes. Electrical Supply. Yes. And uh, we're going to get into that a little bit. But what I'm really interested in is, is really your journey as an owner, entrepreneur, founder, right? So that, to me, is what's really fascinating. I think for a lot of our listeners who are fellow travelers with you, going through the same kind of experiences, it's always good to hear from somebody else. So simple question. Why did you start your business? So um, it, it, the short answer is to provide great opportunities for our employees and for myself. Um, I had worked in the industry for about um, a little over 10 years uh, before starting the company. And um, the companies that I worked for, um, you reached a, a plateau with them and really couldn't move up um, if you're an ambitious individual, move up through the organization very fast. And so I had worked for a few different companies and um, reached those plateaus with each one of them and found myself having to switch positions or companies in order to um, move up through an organization. And so uh, one day, uh, one, of the, one of the girls who uh, worked for me at one of those companies called me up and said, I just moved to a new city. I've been trying to find a job there. They, you know, I have a sales job, I wanna do commission. You know, they, they just want me to be an hourly person. I'm really ambitious um, I, and I liked working for you. So what do you think about starting an organization and I'll come along with you? And I didn't think about it too much before that. Um, this is in 2004, but I was at a point in my life where um, I, was, I was feeling like I really wanted to see what I could achieve. And so I said, yes, I, I took the leap and that's how it started. Wow. Well, that's interesting, right? Because you hear you have, I mean, I've heard the story where somebody says, you know, like a college roommate or something says, let's start this business. But this is actually somebody who says, look, I'd rather work for you. Right. And can you start a business, please? So I can work for you, which is yes. great. I love that, that part of the story. And she's still there now. Wow. Wow. Yep. So sometimes we just need a little bit of uh, inspiration, right? I mean, some people start businesses with inspiration, some with desperation for all right. kinds of reasons. Right. But in this case, it was a challenge. And then you, you, the backdrop, and I think is a really good insight there. There are certain people that are wired that really just want to get, get it going. And right. if you don't provide a context for them, even you now as an employer, if you don't give people forward motion to go, you can lose good people that way. Right. No, it's true. And, um, you know, we, when, when we got going with this, I made a promise to this employee and a, and a promise to myself that we will never put a limit on the people that work for our company. They, they can um, achieve as much as they want to achieve, and, but it's going to take hustle. It's going to take hard work. And they'll have to take advantage of the opportunities, but we're never going to tell somebody, this is it, this is the most you're ever going, going to achieve. Um, we always give them the opportunity to move up and to do as well as they want to do. And so that's the why we exist. That's our, that's our purpose for existing. That's a core value, right? You wanted to create yes. an environment. Uh, you wanted to like re, rewire the game. Right. Be something that you would have liked playing in, right? right. Had it existed, exactly. right? Yes. Okay. And so that, that really raises a question for me, Greg, a little bit is like, how does that affect your selection and hiring process? Because not everybody, some people want really tight structure and they want to be in a box because less to think about and other people, you know, want to stand on the box. 
So right. how do you how do you go about? I'm just curious. How do you go about picking who's going to be a good fit for you? So it doesn't mean that you you can't stay in a box if you want to stay in a box. I mean, there's people that we have that just want an admin role and and that's what they want and we have a need for an admin role and that's okay. Um, but then there's people that come to us and say, you know, I'm a I'm a salesperson, you know, I'm I'm highly driven, I'm very ambitious. I want somewhere where I can I can grow my my revenue and my commissions you know, as, as much as possible. And in that case, we say, come on board and we'll do everything to help you. And there'll be no limit and you can achieve whatever goals you set out to achieve. So we, we look for those kinds of people and, and it's really role specific. Um, you want salespeople that are never satisfied, right? Mm -hmm. Always appreciative, never satisfied. That's one of my mottos. I like so you, want, you want salespeople that are never satisfied but then there's also positions where, you know, maybe it's a production position or an admin position. You know, there's some people that say, you know, I, I just want to do this and that's okay too. We don't tell people they have to move up, but if they want to, there's always an opportunity for them. Right, so there's the growth that they want, right? So it's, it's, it's actually the same thing like when we, when we think about customer centric organizations, we have to think about what does the customer want? before right. we necessarily just say this is what i want to sell you it's more right. like well what are you what are you looking at? What, what are you looking to buy what are you looking right. to solve which is very different but i do want to get to that little uh, something you just said it's a subtle little thing but i really picked up on it greg it, especially when you talk to sales just that always appreciative never satisfied correct right? so that resonate with with me in that sometimes you can hire a good salesperson who might be able a good producer but it's a bit of a jerk and hard to work with and mm -hmm. and it always feels like you always feel like you it doesn't matter what you do for them they're never going to be happy so it seems like culture wise you want a positive growth culture yes but that like you want people to be not jerks yeah and that's that's a challenge um because we've you know we've had people that have worked for us that weren't so nice to work with and, um, but you know, what, what I tell people when we have our meetings um, quarterly, I say, look, you're going to spend more time with the people in this company than you are with your own family. You know, because yeah. you, if you think about it, you're at work eight or nine hours a day, right? Sure. Rarely are you home for nine hours awake and interacting right. with your family. So you, you have to be very careful with the people that you choose to work with. You know, us, you know, as, me as, a, as an employer, and the employee as well. And we tell them that, you know, when you take this job, you have to like the people that you're working with and we have to like you. So we, when we interview people, we interview them as much for behavior and culture fit as we do for skills and experience. Not that skills and experience aren't important because they are, but you have to have the right behavior and the right culture fit because we rarely fire somebody for not being able to do the job it's almost always based on some kind of behavior either they don't get along with people um, they're not trustworthy they're not honest they um you know they they show up late they don't care things like that those are all behavior things um, they're not really performance things although they affect performance they aren't they aren't you know a deficiency in their skills it's just a behavior thing so we we do testing we, um, we, we do a lot of different interviews. We, we always do in-person interviews, which was a challenge in the last year, but we, we have several different managers interview them. And then we do a collaborative hiring approach where any one manager can veto the hiring and then, and then they won't go through. You know, as the CEO, you know, I, I, you know, sure I could override it and just hire people, but then I have somebody on board that one of the managers wasn't, wasn't sold on. And, and that's always going to come back to bite me. So I have to have our leadership team all be on board before, before we'll make a hire. And that's in any role, whether it's an admin role, a production role, or, or a you know, vice president. Wow. Well, what that does also, it creates ownership in the hiring, right? So yes. It's never, well, Greg, you know, you decided to bring so-and-so on and we kind of told you it wasn't a good idea. Right. Now that's your mess to clean up. 
Uh, right. This way, it's our mess to clean up if we got it wrong. Exactly. And it does work that way, too, where I'll say, well, you know, we all decided they were a good fit. And then everybody feels equally guilty if they don't work out right. <laughs> and equally responsible. And, and so if, they. You know. No, and the thing is, too, Greg, is you hire enough people, you, no one's going to bat a thousand, right? I mean, there's just right. some people that interview incredibly well and then they, right. when they show up and you go, was this the same person? Or was exactly. it their twin, you know, who yes. interviewed? So you just don't know. Wow. So, so one thing I just want to dig in a little bit on, on culture, right? So you're running, um, you know, an owner led a smaller business, right? You're not an enterprise, you're not a Microsoft right. size company. Mm -hmm. um, so keeping culture in good times and bad, right? So like this last, you know, last year was, I'm sure very, you know, shocking to many, most people in the world. Like, what do we do now? Right. Um, how, what did you do? What, what did you find to be a best practice to keep everybody's head in the game mm -hmm. and kind of positive at a time when maybe a lot of things were unknown? Well, we, we have principles um, for the company that don't change, regardless mm -hmm. of the circumstances around us. Um, and some of those principles are, number one, um, we, we never talk about each other behind their back. You know, if, if there's an issue, we go to the person directly or we go up to a manager and then we bring the person in and talk to them. And so that's that's one of our principles. The other one is, is that we do the right thing no matter what, regardless of whether it hurts or not. So, you know, example, if, uh, you know, I use this one pretty often, if a vendor ships you 11 things, but invoices you for 10, we tell them we got that one other thing, either bill us for it or we can send it back to you. You know, so that's a that's a trustworthy and honest thing, right? And then another principle is is that we do what it takes to take care of the customer. We don't leave the customer, you know, out in the cold. You know, if they need us, we and and it's possible to do. We take care of them. Um, we had a recent example this last week where we got a call on Friday night, and I always get on this customer because he always calls me on Friday night for his emergencies. I'm like, don't you ever have these things at Tuesday at 10 a.m.? He, he laughs and he goes, no, you know, I'm in the emergency power business, Greg. That's what we do. So, <laughs> so I said, you know, of course, we'll take care of you. Um, it was 4th of July weekend. Oh, boy. I, I called my shop manager and I said, Vince, you know, we, we've, we, we have to get this done. You know, can you ask who is willing to come in over the weekend and, and build this project so we can get it out. And then, you know, we, we had more than enough people volunteer, come in, build it. Of course, you know, we, we paid them accord, accordingly, but they came in, they built it, got it there early and took care of the customer. And so that's the, you know, that's the mentality everybody has to have is that we're, you know, we're always gonna take care of the customer. So those, those principles are solid. Like they, everybody knows them. When, when they're here, we don't write them and put them on a wall. They're, they're just known. Um, and, and they don't even have to ask me. They know what they're supposed to do because it's the right thing. And so, you know, actually they get in trouble if they ask me. If they ask me what the right thing to do is when they know, then I'm, I'm, I, I feel like I failed. It's like, how do you not know what the right thing to do is? You know, we've talked about this. You're empowered to do the right thing. You're, you're, you need to do that all the time without question. And so those principles, I think, is what have really held us together as an organization is that everybody's on the same page, whether we're working at home or, or in an office. They, we, you know, we all feel like a team and we know our mission. And so that, that keeps us headed in the right direction. Well, you know, looking at that, you say, you know, we, you don't talk behind people's backs, so no gossip, right? Yes. Uh, especially work-related things, things that you, if you have an issue with somebody, a beef with somebody, like yes. work it out or go through proper channels to get it resolved. Yep. Do the right things, period. I love that because then you're never worried about like, well, will they find out? Will they know? Will they, will this come out right. in some later, you know, uh, audit or something like that? It's always, right. always above board and people will give you the benefit of the doubt, both customers and suppliers in future dealings. And then you do what it takes to take care of the customer that that can do spirit, which I think every smaller entrepreneurial company has to do. That's what sets you apart from like the big boys that you might be Absolutely. competing against. 
Wow. Well, so like the golden rule come to life in business. I love it. It's yeah. very good. It's, it's, yeah. it's so as you, as you look out at your customer base and, and, and just take a moment, just describe what, what your firm, what, what you primarily do. I know you do a number of things, but why would you describe in summary form what you're doing for who? So we have diverse res- revenue streams by design. So, so we're a, an electrical distributor that's in several different markets. Um, one of the markets that we're in is um, industrial and commercial uh, large switchgear projects in, in Las Vegas. Mm. So we've done projects like the T-Mobile Arena. Um, we're doing um, the MSG Sphere. We did convention center upgrades. So we, we do all these large multi-million dollar projects in Las Vegas um, through our switchgear group. Uh, we also handle mines. So large um, copper, gold, silver mines throughout the country. We sell products to them. So that's a, that's a different group. Um, we do uh, temporary power to um, commercial industrial contractors, to large uh, generator dealers, um, to you know, people like that. And that's a whole group that does that as well. So we, we have um, a few different revenue streams and we have people in each one of those um, departments that um, have ownership over those revenue streams. Um, so in our, in our switch gear group, there's three people there and they manage, they manage the, the bidding and the project management for the projects there. The, the portable power group has people there that, that have ownership over growing that business and taking care of the customer there. And then mining, uh, the salespeople there have, you know, they're specialists in, in that industry and they handle the electrical distribution for the mines um, all over the country there. So we, we have it set up, you know, kind of segmented, which each one of the different uh, markets that we're in has people that are in charge of making sure those two customers are taken care of and that the revenue keeps growing. Well, so that what's interesting about that, right, is I, I've I've worked with many owner-led businesses that try to do multiple revenue streams, mm-hmm. but they don't always make the investment in dedicated headcount to yes. each of those things. So you have they say like I have my VP of sales, and meanwhile that person has to have the headspace to keep track of these. In your example, three lines of business, right, with very different buyers and different criteria for why people buy. Yes. And not to mention the product knowledge that you have to have. So, so I'm assuming you didn't start day one when that, when that, when that person called you and say, Hey, start a business. You didn't start with three lines of business overnight. Okay. So I'm just curious, how did that that happen? Trial and error, uh, more error than trial. We, we, uh, you know, we, we started with a few people that were selling to the mines is really how we started. Um, and then, and then I had some connections in the Caterpillar world. And so then we, we started working on that, but we, we, we had salespeople that were doing both and crossing over and, and, um, you know, it got messy. Uh, there was, there was, you know, when someone would, would, you know, have an account that's a mine and then they get an account that was a generator dealer, you know, they, their product knowledge wasn't up to speed on one of, one of the two. And so they would struggle a little bit. And so it was probably about five or six years ago, really, that I started being a lot more committed to the different markets Mm -hmm. and putting things in place to handle the different markets, including locations and, um, you know, dividing up the office into uh, like pods, for lack of a better term, Mm -hmm. where, you know, the, the switch gear group is together in this part of the office. The um, mining group is together over here. Not, and not that these groups don't talk to each other because we very much act as one company, but they, they know that this is their area of responsibility and it, and it keeps their head um, you know, cleaner and, and, and more focused than if they knew if they had all these other different jobs that they were supposed to be doing. So they're, they're more specialized in their area but then still act as, as part of the company as a whole. 
Well, that's that's and I can see that. I mean, immediately I can't. I start thinking about like a hospital. Everybody has a specialization, but you're all part of the same hospital. It may not be a great example, but it's what came to mind as you as yes. you painted that picture of the pods. You know, each in the different specialization. Uh, so when you look out, and 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 I don't need this necessarily to be a um, very pod or industry specific answer, but just generally as you look out because you're in all these industrial categories. What do you think? And it's just your opinion, you know, uh, are some of the biggest challenges your customers are facing or concerned about looking downstream? I think it changes um, depending on the on the um, the market conditions and, and you know, even the political environment and, and um, you know, lots of different factors. You know, it was, you know, um, you know, during COVID time, it was it was getting people to that could produce things to actually come in work together you know the so called essential businesses to produce things now we have material shortages and inflation mm. uh, and and worker shortages uh, there's been there's been times where we've had recessions where um, you know the the distributors were suffering because there just wasn't enough business out there i mean i think in 2009 um, the industry in general dropped about 35%. Wow. And when you have a company that's revenue goes down 35%, you know, without, without really seeing it coming, it, it causes you to, to make a lot of changes internally to be able to still operate profitably. A lot of people didn't, um, but, but you have to, you know, make changes. And then when business comes back, you have to then, you know, readjust. So now business is back, but maybe I, I, you know, had to cut some of my workforce or I downsized my um, warehouse space or something like that. Now you have to pivot again to the new environment. So, you know, and all these things affect, you know, the customers all the way down the line because, you know, they're reliant on their supply chain who is constantly adapting to whatever the, the current environment is. You know, right now, like I said, we, we have... Um, material shortages and so we we have a lot of people coming to us and saying you know we need this and i need it in this time and you know we're we're jumping through hoops to try to make it happen but it's a challenge you know to to set expectations properly and say we're going to do everything we can but we can't get wire so we're we're trying our best you know and so but we're just being open and honest with people about what's going on and, and keeping that communication open. And, and then everybody all the way down the supply chain is just having to adapt to the current market conditions. Right, and one of the, the, it seems to me, one of the most valuable things you can offer to your supply chain is just the truth. Because, the, because they need to plan around, if it's bad news, I'd rather know, you know, everybody, you'd really right. rather know bad news early then oh i know we told you we would get that but right. it, it couldn't happen so so now they're like it there at noon and and it's one o'clock and we say oh yeah by the way it won't be there till tomorrow yeah that's never good that's never good wow wow great well uh, just a quick question here then as we come to to kind of our close of our time thank you so much for sharing with us sure. on on the revenue throughput podcast i'm sure our listeners really appreciate it Sure. Uh, but if you if you were to, so think about it, our listeners are mostly owners like you, owner operators of of B two B businesses. So if you had one tip to share, one nugget of wisdom from your experience or that you think is relevant looking forward, it doesn't have to be like uh, Confucius says; it just has to be something right. you think is true. What would right. that be? What would you share with your fellow owners? Oh, I would say the biggest mistake people get in in the beginning is they take on too much debt, and they and they. Tr- they don't get as involved as owners as they should. If, if you're going to take that leap and start your own company, then you need to roll up your sleeves. You need to work hard and you need to try to bootstrap it as much as you can and, and try not to get into too much debt. You know, inevitably you're going to need lines of credit and, and banking relationships, but you know, don't start off with a million dollars in debt of borrowed money. And then, and then, you know, and then be under the gun to try to make things happen. You know, if, if let's say you're, you know, you're starting a restaurant or you want to do that, you know, start it in a food truck, you know, and then, and then build your way up from there, you know, whatever it is, try to cash flow your operations as much as possible. 
Wow. Okay. That sounds like that sounds like you speak from experience. So I love it. It's good stuff. Greg, thanks again. And if somebody listening to this wants to know more about you and your business, where should they go online? Sure. Our website is atielectrical.com. And that's also our online store. So that has information about the company, information about our products, that has product videos, specifications, um, you know, about us. You, you can know more about the company by going there. Um, you can call us at 800-597-9311. And we actually take texts through that number as well. Um, okay. If you, if you have a question or a need, you can text us there as well. So that, that's where you can find us. Greg, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today on the Revenue Throughput Podcast. It's appreciated. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. 